My name is Marie Wilson. I'm visiting today from Yellowknife, though I spent much of my youth in this part of the country. There's a beautiful little cemetery, a country cemetery in southwestern Ontario, not far from here. I spent part of my weekend there, remembering. My father had a great sense of humor. Everyone he knew seemed to have a funny story about something he'd said or done. And if time allowed, I'd tell you my favorite, the one about the tombstone. As I visited my parents' grave the other day, I found myself smiling at the memory of that story. And I found myself tearing up as I pulled grass from the memorial plaque beside the stone. It says, he served his country. I also see another grave site in my mind's eye. Just imagine the lonely isolation, rural Saskatchewan, weathered white faces, fences with fading teddy bears. It's the burial ground of Regina Industrial School, one of Canada's oldest Indian residential schools. Feelings overwhelm me. What if the children lying here were my ancestors? What if the children and grandchildren in my life were taken away by government agents, police, or religious leaders with promises of good education only to end their shortened lives in such an abandoned field, plots overrun, graves unmarked. Most haunting is the familiarity. This is not the first such school graveyard I have visited or heard about. Early this century, residential school survivors from the past hundred years took Canada and the churches that ran the schools to court. A massive legal settlement included a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so I became a commissioner of the first TRC in the Western world and the first to focus on harms done to our nation's own children. Almost 7,000 survivors recounted the harms of their school days to us. Family rupture, fear, humiliation, abuses of all kinds. The most definitive harm was death itself, as many spoke for the voiceless, those they had seen die and those they had known to have died or disappeared as schoolmates, friends, siblings. 3,200 Indigenous children died at residential schools. A thousand others were sent home or to Indian hospitals to die there, and likely double that number at least, all told. For countless others were only partially recorded. A first-name child here, a no-name child there, sometimes a home community reference for another, and only maybe a gender. Some were sick, some died in fires in condemned school buildings, some drowned or froze to death trying to run away, the cause of death for many not even recorded. The negligent record keeping and disproportionate deaths, like the schools themselves, were built on a foundation of attitudes. A belief that Indigenous people were inferior, that their cultures could, should, and would be extinguished. And the fastest and cheapest way to do that was to put their children in residential schools far from their parents and cultural teachings. Many children now lie in school cemeteries long since abandoned, some in mass graves, some buried before their parents were ever told of their passing, cause of death, or gravesite location. Our TRC created the National Residential School Death Register, the only national effort ever made to record the names of all students who died and to locate their graves often unmarked. But we are nowhere close to finding them all. Reconciliation on this front needs resources and much more research and analysis to identify and locate the rest of the missing. Yet as my heart and mind return to this Saskatchewan field, I remain hopeful. 
local communities there, churches and governments working together to identify the buried, reconnect family ties, protect and consecrate the grounds where the children lie. Historic strangers now working together in the name of social justice and reconciliation for the sake of those children. Come with me now to another place, farther west, central Alberta. A few years back, a farmer came across what appeared to be four burial sites at the edge of a field. He didn't just plow or plant them over. He notified someone, and things began to shift. The church that ran a nearby residential school and the nearby indigenous spiritual leaders collaborated in a traditional four-year-long sending home ceremony for these four newly found and more than a hundred other former students from the Red Deer School. Does anything compare with the emotional impact of learning the names of the deceased in the case of multiple deaths? It humanizes the massive loss of life, transforms victims from statistics to somebody's relatives, helps us relate to the enormity of the tragedy. We have a long history of noting the names of the fallen on public monuments to victims of war. Even more powerful is the experience of hearing those names read aloud. I can still hear the names from that Alberta day. Children's names. They didn't go to war, they went to school. Family descendants and willing strangers have come together to resurrect the value of these forgotten little lives. Eyes are moist, voices quiver with more attentive care this day than our country seemed capable of offering these children during their lifetimes. And in the midst of such reverence, I find myself thinking about Remembrance Day. My grandfather was a soldier in both world wars. My oldest uncles fought in World War II, and my father served the final year of that war in Canada, starting right off here in Wolseley Barracks. All of that influenced our family culture. I spent many bittersweet childhood days gathered around public cenotaphs. I've raised my children and grandchildren to do the same, learning about those wars and others since, learning to honor the fallen, learning to remember, lest we forget. For me, the comparisons are obvious. Our Truth and Reconciliation Commission motto was, for the child taken, for the parent left behind. As a country, we understand the heartache of a mother who has lost son or daughter to war. We make great efforts to bring home with dignity and ceremony anyone lost and to honor the parent left behind. Each year, we name a Civil Cross mother to represent all grieving parents. We mark Remembrance Day in national ceremony in all our schools and at monuments throughout the country to honor all veterans, living or dead. And we acknowledge collectively those never found with the tomb of the unknown soldier. Yet we have never demonstrated such reverence for residential school children who also we lost in a state-sanctioned context of proven harms. We have failed to keep any official track of them, much less bring them home in ceremony. We have shown unceremonious disregard for any parent left behind. How many days have we ever gathered together nationally to remember thousands of children who died on Canada's own soil? As for the missing, in circumstances still unknown, where is our national monument to the unknown child? We are a country still learning to remember. Indeed, we are a country with much still to learn about many things, but especially about each other. The 94 calls to action of our Truth and Reconciliation Commission are all about that, some of them specifically about the missing children. We all have work to do, governments, all sectors of society, people like you and me. We need to act as nonpartisan priority 
on the urgency of those TRC calls to action. This is just beginning to take hold in Canada as we deepen our understanding of our own history. And so, in this season of remembrance, I remain standing and speaking from a countrywide field of heartache and possibility. The possibility that together we will work to uphold the lives of seven generations of Indigenous peoples we have harmed and to remember the beloved little ones we allowed to get lost along the way, lest we forget. <laughs>